Feeding armed conflicts, weapon sales have soared in the last five years, especially to Asia and the Middle East. So who's benefiting from the boom in business? And what does it mean for world security? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. It's no secret that war, conflict and insecurity is good for the global arms business. It's perhaps no surprise that a rise in real or perceived threats is being mirrored in the thriving trade being done by the world's biggest weapons producers. New figures from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute show just how much. Arms sales have been growing for years with a 14% rise in the last five years on the five years before that. Countries in Asia and the Middle East are the biggest buyers. India and Saudi Arabia are first and second. Currently at war with forces across the border in Yemen, the kingdom's arms imports almost trebled compared with the period between 2006 and 2010. This is the full list of the world's biggest arms importers. China remains in the top three, though interestingly, its share has decreased quite dramatically as Beijing continues to pour money into developing its own arms manufacturing industry. That's borne out in the list of the world's biggest arms exporters, where China has now overtaken France and Germany, sitting behind the world's big two, the US and Russia. Well, let's now bring in our guests to discuss all of this. In Stockholm, we have Peter Weizemann, senior researcher in the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, Arms and Military Expenditure Program. In New Delhi, Manoj Joshi, head of the National Security Program for the Observer Research Foundation. And in Brussels, Thomas Baum, director of the Flemish Peace Institute, an independent parliamentary research institute. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with uh, Peter Weizemann. A 14% increase in arms exports over the past five years. Is there any dominant reason why this is happening? No, I think it's something which is related to developments uh, which are independent but happen in different parts of the world. So for example, the increasing demand in Southeast Asia is uh, uh, one part of it, but at the same time there's also an increasing demand uh, in North Africa and one in the Middle East. Those things don't necessarily hang together, they just happen at the same time. Well, Manoj Joshi, uh, your view, uh, what do you think is the major reason for this increase? Well, I think insofar as India is concerned, the major reason is that uh, India's modernization program has been delayed by something like uh, a decade or a decade and a half. So we have programs that ought to have been done by the year 2000, but they're still uh, trying to complete them. So there's a bit of, uh, there tends to be a bit of a bunching uh, at times. And so right now, if you ask the three services, uh, they say that, you know, our modernization is going to complete by 2025, 2027. So this thing goes on. And I think this is the pressure, uh, this bunching of programs, uh, which shows these sharp increases. Well, Thomas Palmer, referring specifically to India there, we have uh, the uh, problem with its arms industry uh, domestically. Uh, but to what extent is its massive expenditure due to its strategic perception of threats from uh, its immediate neighbors, for example? Um, I would guess India would qualify uh, as, as, as an emerging power in military terms as well, increasingly. Uh, of course, there's a long-standing dispute with Pakistan, which uh, necessitates uh, quite some capacity. Also, for India uh, and China, there's some, uh, not an evident relationship all the times. And I also think the domestic issues in India, uh, there's quite some conflict within the country as well, necessitate uh, some capacity. Manoj Joshi, uh, staying with, with the issue of India, to what extent is the strategic threat that it might perceive uh, a reason for it being such a huge spender on uh, imports? Well, if you actually look at the statistics, India is not such a huge spender on defense, meaning its, its uh, expenditure is below 3% uh, of, uh, of its GDP. But the fact of the matter is India simply lacks any kind of a significant arms uh, manufacturing industry. 
so it's got to virtually import everything. It imports 70 to 75 percent uh, of its arms, and I suspect that the import component is even larger because uh, some of the products that it has in its armed forces uh, import assemblies and sub-assemblies uh, from other countries. Uh, so I su the, the, the problem is simply uh, the fact that it simply does not have a, an armed industry of any standing. Well, uh, Peter Vazeman, on the other side of the coin, so to speak, uh, we're taking a look at China where you've got a massive drop in their imports and a massive increase in their exports. Is this a reflection of a increasingly developed um, military, uh, military body within the country itself? Yes, uh, it certainly is. I think uh, when we contrast that what we to, uh, to what we see and what just has been described in the case of India, we can certainly say that where, where India has constantly failed, China now has finally succeeded. China uh, um, was had a very out-of-date arms industry for a long while. Then it got the chance to import very significant amounts of Russian military arms and also technology, the means to actually build and then to develop its own uh, military technology to a level that it now has become a serious competitor to uh, arms industries in Russia, Europe and even in the US. It's not yet there, it's not at the same level, but the quality of the arms which uh, China can produce now clearly is far, far uh, beyond what it used to do and, and therefore they are no longer that dependent on arms imports anymore. Having said that, uh, they still are the third largest arms importer in the world and they probably will be somewhere in that league for some time to, uh, to be because they still haven't mastered some of the, uh, the most key technologies uh, you need to produce weapons which can really measure up to what is being produced uh, in the more established arms producers in the world. Um, and as a result, China has also become a major exporter of arms now. Countries actually want to have Chinese equipment. Um, it's no longer second rate per se, but you can actually buy some something in China uh, which, which can compete with what you can buy in Europe, Russia or the USA. Well, a ton of bomb. Uh the Asian and Oceanian uh, countries are, are, are leading in, in the import of arms. Vietnam, for example, has increased its imports by 699% in recent years. Is this a reflection of strategic concerns within the region, particularly uh, uh, the dispute about the South China Sea? Of course, there's always this context in security, but I would assume it, it's generally always uh, the case uh, in, in different parts of the world as well. The one thing one has to make sure that this uh, perception of insecurity, uh, which is understandable, which then leads to, um, let's say, armaments races or more inquisition of arms, would not increase insecurity in its term and then you get this vicious circle. So I think, of course, that uh, there is a perception of threat, there is a, a, a perceived need. But uh, hence one should put maybe more efforts in, in, in export control um, and, um, initiatives. You see, for example, that the, the Wassenaar regime, where the nine of the top exporters are coming together uh, on a permanent basis to control their exports in order to not have destabilizing accumulations, that, that nine out of ten are, of the top exporters are members of that informal regime. So there is a, say, a shared uh, concern uh, and a shared approach, uh, more or less, uh, to, to dealing with exports in, in, a, uh, in a similar or in a, in a shared fashion in, in some ways. At the same time, though, there is increasing uh, co competition among those who supply weapons. Um, Manoj Joshi, with, with India, for example, uh, there's a great deal of uh, interplay between Russia and the United States. Uh, vying for that particular market. Russia, the biggest supplier at present, clearly the United States wanting to be. So there is great competition among those who provide arms, is there not? And also those countries who want to import arms do have an increasing amount of choice about where they're going to import from, as is uh, India's case. Well, uh, that's true only up to a part. In the sense, yes, the Europeans are also there uh, who are uh, big players in this business as far as India is concerned. Uh, of course, China has been embargoed, so uh, there's a problem there. Uh, so as far as India is concerned, we have uh, Russia, we have the Europeans, and we have the Americans. Now, the thing is that the Americans clearly have some of the most advanced arms, but the Americans 
tend to look at their arms exports through uh, uh, the prism uh, of politics and in the sense that they have certain terms and conditions uh, that they want you to fulfill, whereas the Europeans and the Russians uh, are quite easy on that. Uh, and the Russians, uh, above all, provide you systems uh, which nobody else does, meaning uh, the Russians are helping us build a nuclear-propelled submarine which absolutely but uh, no one but no one would have helped us uh, on. So we do have choice uh, at a certain level, uh, but at a certain level, if you're really looking for the best, uh, you'd like to go for something that the United States offers you. Well, once again, uh, Peter Weiserman taking a look at, at, at specifics here. Um, as we've mentioned, Saudi Arabia's arms imports have almost tripled. Now, once again, the question, is this part of a perceived that they might have? Is it part of the uh, kingdom's struggle for dominance in the region, particularly uh, with regard to Iran? Is it possible to pin down any single of these factors uh, that would account for this massive increase in arms imports? I first have to say that the problem with Saudi Arabia uh, different from, so for, for example, with India, is that the reasons for the arms procurement are generally quite secret. We don't have white papers or other documents which explain us in detail why they buy them. Having said that, we can, of course, based on the information which we see around, uh, make assessments of why they do this. And it is very clear that for Saudi Arabia, um, it wants to be a regional player. It sees, in particular, Iran as a competitor, and it does see arms as a very important part of its foreign policy and, and security policy in the region. So it is very willing to buy arms to, on the one hand, deter Iran directly, even though Iran doesn't have access to the same type of armament as Saudi Arabia has. Iran is still a United Nations arms embargo. Um, but still, um, it, it wants to de de deter Iran. It wants to de uh, deter Iran from meddling in the eternal affairs of other states, which Saudi Arabia sees as a threat to Saudi Arabian influence. Uh, in the region. And so there we also see that Saudi Arabia buys those web weapons to actually use them in the conflict, for example, in Yemen. Uh, and that's something new and that's important to stress here too. It's no longer just the case that Saudi Arabia and several other countries in the region acquire uh, advanced weapons in large numbers, but now they have also taken the initiative um, of using them by themselves, no longer led by the United States, but actually going in themselves in Yemen in Syria, in Libya, for example. Well, Thomas Baum, this is an important point, is it not? The fact that the weapons are actually being used, Saudi operating um, basically on its own and, and uh, using the weapons in conflicts in, um, among its neighbors. Yeah, and especially in the European Union, this has been a bit of a game changer, I would say. Uh, traditionally, the Saudi Arabia as a destination country would have been problematized on, a, on account of its human rights records or something. But now that they actually go operational in Yemen, and there are also reports on uh, violations of international humanitarian law in these activities, it becomes increasingly difficult to sustain uh, the, the view that Saudi Arabia is like this regional ally against Iran that deserves uh, products in, in a kind of bigger balancing act. Um, and I, I think uh, one wants to account for that change over, over the longer term, I guess. Now, for the European Union particularly, they have this, I think, most well-developed export control system where they actually agree on criteria that should be used to assess the opportunity of an export. So and respect for international humanitarian law, respect for human rights is in there, as well as the aim of not c contributing to regional escalation as not uh, mingling in these internal affairs. It's all, it's all in the agreed framework. Uh, was never problematized to a big extent by large groups, but one hears in, in Europe and in the European Parliament and in different national parliaments of European member states that normally would deliver to Saudi Arabia without much ado, that they're now questioning uh, the opportunity of these deliveries. Uh, no, no, uh, Joshi, I mean, that extent uh, of control of the weapons that are acquired I mean, to what extent within a country like India, for example, are there checks and balances? To what extent is the acquisition of weaponry uh, acquired, is it as a deterrence or is it regarded as, as we've seen with Saudi Arabia, a, a possibility of actual use? How is it uh, re re regarded in India? Well, as I told you at the outset, that uh, a large part of Indian acquisitions 
are really modernization in the sense large chunks of the Army, Navy, and Air Force have uh, systems which are completely obsolete. The Army hasn't got uh, a new artillery piece for almost 30 years. Uh, the Navy is operating submarines, uh, which, which, which we got almost 25, 30 years ago. Uh, the Air Force is operating MiG-21s, which have to retire. So a uh, large part of it is modernization. And unfortunately, it does, doesn't leave enough to provide for the deterrence part of it. Meaning, yes, deterrence is an important um, calculation, and particularly important one with regard to China, which is spending a huge amount of money uh, to modernize its forces. Uh, unfortunately for India, uh, it simply doesn't have those kind of resources uh, to deploy. And what we have been witnessing, increased Chinese activity uh, in the Indian Ocean uh, in the past two, three years. Uh, so all this requires uh, uh, India to adopt a certain deterrent posture, uh, but it's unable to do so, uh, partly because of the slippages in its modernization program and the fact that it simply lacks a, um, a, an effective uh, arms industry, which is something which would take maybe 20 to 25 years to build up if you started, if you began today. And uh, with regard to Pakistan, uh, once again, there would be a deterrence uh, to a certain extent there, but also to what extent is there competition in terms of creating the deterrence with a neighbor like Pakistan? Well, you see, uh, with Pakistan, you know, both of us are nuclear weapons uh, powers. So both of us have an ultimate kind of a deterrent in terms uh, uh, with the, uh, the use of nuclear weapons. When it comes to conventional weaponry, uh, I think if you look at the figures, if you look at them carefully, you'll find that by and large, uh, there is approximate parity. Uh, in the frontage in which you could have a possible clash, uh, meaning you, you, uh, we are assuming that you, you, you have a clash which could last a week, two weeks, ten days. Uh, in that particular frontage, the, 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 there is near parity between the two uh, countries. Don't forget, uh, Pakistan also acquires a large amount of uh, weaponry. The United States alone has given them $17 billion uh, in the, uh, since 2001 uh, for their modernization program. And the Saudis also keep on giving them uh, undisclosed sums of money. Well, uh, Peter Vesemann, I, I want to move on just slightly um, onto the issue of mm -hmm. the circle of acquisitions, as, as, as it is described. Uh, you mentioned in your report, for example, that half of arms imported into Africa, for example, go to Algeria and Morocco. Now, it appears that a situation has arisen where one country is obtaining weaponry, the other one gets uncomfortable or concerned, it then does so, and once again, the other country will then have to get great more weaponry. Is, is this a, uh, a, a, an issue, do you believe, this uh, question of circle of acquisitions as it is described? Yeah, I think you have given a very accurate example there. The example of Algeria, Morocco, there you have a typical, a classic action reaction um, arms procurement process. One country, and I don't say who started first, I think that doesn't matter anymore. One con con country buys new equipment, the other one, the neighboring one, which has had long standing territorial disputes and other disputes, then reacts to that and buys other arms. But then the problem is even more uh, difficult. But then you see, for example, that Algeria will invest in new weapons which are partly aimed at dealing with in, uh, internal issues dealing with Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb or similar groups. But those weapons could also be directed towards Morocco. So Morocco is never really sure what those weapons are for. And so they feel that they have to react to that. And they then also buy weapons in return or in reaction. And the problem here is, and this is an important part of it, that the weapons are often supplied by more or less the same group of countries. So if we look at who supplies the weapons to Algeria, then it is Russia, but also uh, a series of European states, for example, Germany uh, and Italy. When we look at Morocco, it is Russia to some extent, it is the US, and it is again the European states, for example, the Netherlands. And, and so you see how the exporters are going, uh, it seems, very much for the money. They see an opportunity to sell, but they don't really seem to take into account this risk of an arms race or at least an, an, an aggressive action reaction uh, arms procurement pattern between two states. Thomas Baum, uh, this is returning to a point that you touched on a short while ago in terms of the controls 
over the arms industry, whether there should be self-regulation. Here we have the example of uh, potential conflict between two countries getting increasing amounts of weaponry uh, being egged on or uh, being supported by those who wish to sell that particular uh, weaponry. Um, that issue of, of control, can it be self-regulating or does there have to be some wider convention that would keep uh, the, the industry itself uh, more safe, if one could put it like that? Okay. There have been considerable efforts vis-à-vis uh, -vis making an international arms trade treaty that has entered into force already in uh, December 2014, exactly with that aim of getting global standards for agreeing on arms exports. Of course, uh, states are very reluctant to give up this sovereignty, uh, both to being a bit blocked in their buying, but also in their selling of stuff. So this, these were very tough negotiations. And one sees, for example, that uh, China and Russia are not part of, uh, of the deal in the end, and that uh, the United States only very hesitantly became a partisan for the good cause. Nevertheless, I think this is the way to go. Um, uh, the, I think the shared bottom line that the states can discover in working on an international regulation on the selling of, selling of arms is their joint problem with non-state actors. And I think this could be like the, the carrot that, uh, that helps the process to go further. Of course, as I said before, sovereignty is highly valued. Whatever export control system there is, it's always with criteria that can be applied. There's always other considerations at play and national security, your own defense capacity, money plainly uh, and all those interests, these material interests often supersede, I would say, the more ideational or, or idealist interests in, in controlling these, uh, these products, basically. Peter Wiesemann, uh, there was a very interesting point that was touched on there, and that is the emergence of non-state actors that we've seen uh, very uh, proliferate in recent years could be the carrot that would encourage the major arms exporters to exert some control over the way in which their weapons are used. Do you think that is possible? I think it certainly is a major concern for the major exporters about how the weapons, especially the smaller arms, the light arms which they export, how they end up in the hands of non-state actors um, and how those non-state actors will use them. For example, in the case of Syria, we talk about IS or elsewhere. This is a major concern, but at the same time, having said that, um, that also kind of pulls us away again of these other concerns. Yes, it is a concern that the weapons which are being exported end up in the hands of terrorists or other militant groups which destabilize con con countries or whole regions. But at the same time, by focusing on that, and that's very much what has happened in the discussion about an international arms trade treaty, we don't put much attention anymore or really on these issues between states on how the supply of large numbers of major and, and advanced arms can actually create tensions between states and create uh, destabilizing build-ups of arms. So I think we have to be careful with that, um, uh, a focus on, on the smaller players, on the non-state actors may may blind us a bit for the other pro problems which are related to the international arms trade. Very quickly, Peter Weisman, do you think that the major uh, exporters could be relied upon to try and exercise some kind of control over the way in which the weapons are used? Um, as of now, I think it's extremely difficult to do so. It is shown over and over again that when you supply arms, there is a significant chance that at a certain point, the country which has acquired them will either use them itself in a way which you don't really want, which you find unacceptable, or that the weapons will get lost and end up in the hands of, for example, terrorist organizations. Post-supply control is extremely difficult and will be so also in the future. Well, at that point, my thanks to our guests, Peter Weiserman, Manoj Joshi, and Thomas Baum. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mike Hanna, and the whole team here, goodbye for now.